Hi, I'm Abdul Saad, clinical psychologist at Vital Mind Psychology here in Sydney, Australia. My website is vitalmind.com.au. That's where you can find out more about me and my approach and the services I offer, including to international clients wherever you are in the world, uh, including the online coaching sessions. You can also check me out at Facebook. Just search for Vital Mind Psychology. This is the third video in this uh, new series on understanding narcissists in romantic relationship relationships. And I want to look at <clears throat> understanding narcissistic devaluation and discard, uh, especially as it relates to the empath and linking up with video one, understanding love bombing and last week's video, which is um, why empaths are particularly vulnerable to love bombing. So the love bombing or idealization phase is short-lived. It does not take long for the narcissist to become deeply disappointed in their love object. The narcissist's idealization of the love object was in fact an idealization of themselves, of the narcissist, and the illusion of perfect union with the perfect partner who the narcissist sees as an extension of themselves. Narcissists also do this with their children. If you look at my video, which, is, which has the highest views of all the videos I've recorded on the childhood origin, origins of narcissism, I explain in detail in that video what I mean by this concept of an ex, uh, seeing others as an extension of themselves. The devaluation phase can begin uh, in a subtle manner, veiled criticisms, failing to show up uh, for a date or being late, showing disinterest during conversation, comparing you to others, giving the silent treatment are all examples of devaluation. And all of these begin to re-trigger the empath's strong internal critic, which remember last week we said during the love bombing phase was uh, temporarily put to bed, put to sleep as, we, as you might say, or at least greatly reduced. So what does this devaluation do to the empath? Well, if we review our model of the empath's three core systems, hyperactivated attachment system, the need to please, and the strong internal critic, we see that the devaluation uh, begins to send the empath into a downward spiral of confusion and despair as they begin to experience a confusing, disorientating, and painful sense of paradise lost. Paradise Lost was what was uh, had in the love bombing phase, uh, what was experienced in the love bombing phase. The sense of them being good enough, even perfect, which is what the narcissist told them through the love bombing phase, um, is now called into question. The empath having had the lived experience of being seemingly unconditionally loved, adored and approved of by the narcissist, now experiences a crushing sense of their own defectiveness or re-experiences this even more so. And the empath is uh, begins to scramble for answers. What have I done wrong? What have I said? What is going on? And here we see that after activating the empath's attachment system, reducing the need to please and their, and their strong internal critic, through even the most subtle devaluation, the empath's need to please and internal critic are massively re-triggered. And this sets the empath on the path of trying to work out why, why has paradise been lost? And a frantic attempt to re-establish what, what they had experienced during the idealization or love bombing phase. Because remember, that was an actual lived experience. Although it was um, based on the narcissist's pathological character structure, the empath still had a lived experience. This wasn't an abstract or theoretical thing. It was an experience they had. Now, if the empath was a love object rather than a love target, I explained the distinction in my first video. Um, that is, they were being maliciously targeted without the narcissist actually having a love interest in them. Then we see the use of devaluation as a powerful tool of intermittent reinforcement, where, these, where, where there are these push-pull dynamics uh, to keep the person on the hook to extract some material gains from them. Now, by love interest, by the way, I'm not suggesting uh, rather than, than a love object, the love interest. 
I'm not suggesting that narcissists or people with narcissistic personality disorder, NPD, can truly love and develop in intimacy because unfortunately they can't. And again, it's for individuals with NPD, a very specific category. A love interest here refers, because a love interest here is referring to the infantile expression of the narcissistic idealization, which appears as love in the initial stage of the relationship, that is love bombing. So the empaths call wounds around their fundamental unworthiness, their, uh, that their needs are not valid or could never be fully met, are re-triggered, leading the empath to work harder than ever to re-establish the idealization phase and try to work out what has gone wrong. And at this stage, we observe the narcissist unleashing their hostility and rage toward the empath for failing to meet the idealized partner that they had imagined them to be. This is the narcissist archetypally manifesting the archetype of uh, the tyrant, you know, the tyrant king who banishes people off with their head. You know, they have not met my standards. They have not mirrored me. And we see people with borderline personality disorder uh, are also capable of doing the same thing, but in a much, usually much less instrumental or um, coordinated or organized way. People with borderline personality disorder tend to be a lot more uh, disorganized and dysregulated. But again, although we're dealing with distinct categories here, they do at some point merge into each other because beneath the narcissistic personality structure is what's called a borderline personality organization. And therefore these are in the same family, the cluster B family. Now the narcissist will continue the relationship even while they're devaluing the other person for a number of reasons, to exact revenge on the empath, to unleash their rage, for failing to be the perfect partner they had imagined them to be, as if this could ever be achieved by any person. Uh, they may continue the relationship to continue extracting supply in the form of admiration from the empath as they pursue the narcissist in a frantic attempt to re-establish what was experienced during idealization, or to take advantage of the empath in some material manner for their, for their body, for their time, for money, for other resources, drip feeding them a diet of intermittent reinforcement, you know, push-pull, where the empath is idealized and then the ideal idealization is, is withdrawn, uh, they're devalued, leaving the empath uh, in a cycle of confusion. Now, whatever they call mo motivation, all narcissists will use a system of intermittent reinforcement of rewards and punishments, which essentially hook the empath. And with each return of idealization, or what you could call the honeymoon phase, albeit short-lived, the empath experiences the hyperactivation of their attachment system, um, the spike in oxytocin and dopamine, these love-based hormones, uh, neurotransmitters. And with each withdrawal of that idealization, they experience the, cr the crushing sense of defeat and the crash of these uh, biological, biological imperative biologically uh, hardwired um, attachment systems. So the high of being completely perfect and loved to the low of being, being completely worthless and irredeemable. Now, during the uh, discard phase, the illusion of perfect union and the intermittent reinforcement, um, uh, during the discard phase, the illusion of perfect union is shattered and, the, uh, and often in a humiliating manner, such as when the narcissist has moved on and signals this explicitly, often by flaunting a new partner. Now recall, this is very important, that any relationship breakup is painful and people, even if they're not pathologically narcissistic, can act in ways that are hurtful and even demeaning. So that's not enough to consider someone to be narcissistic because they behave badly during a breakup. If you're listening to what I'm saying in the videos, there is a pervasive pattern of behavior that's beginning with the love bombing and idealization, and which is going to end with the devaluation and discard with the narcissistic personality disordered individual. So it's not enough to say, well, bad behavior during a breakup is a sign of narcissism or MPD. It can be, but we want to see a continuity with the love bombing, the idealization 
and then the devaluation and discard. So the difference with a narcissist compared to a garden variety person who may act uh, in a dysregulated way, be very upset at a relationship breaking up, express hurtful uh, thoughts and uh, say hurtful things. The difference is that with a narcissist, it's pervasive. It's happened throughout the entire relationship and their behavior is uh, instrumental. It's occurred, there, there, it's occurred throughout the relationship and there is a persistent rage and vindictiveness as the relationship is ending. A deep need to humiliate, to destroy the other and to strip them of their dignity. And this can take multiple forms, including smear campaigns, stalking, uh, threats of intimidation, etc. Um, narcissists essentially want to destroy the other. Hurting them is not enough. Now in next week's video, which will be the uh, fourth video in this uh, series on narcissists, understanding narcissists in romantic relationships. I want to explore the question of, well, what makes narcissists seem so appealing or more appealing than other people, perhaps, as romantic partners, at least at initial contact, at least in the initial phase of coming into contact with them? So I'll be looking at that question next week. I look forward to catching you then, uh, God willing. Again, I hope uh, that you are well and um, look forward to engaging with your comments, uh, any questions. I do uh, do my best to try and read the comments. I can't answer to each one. There's often uh, a lot on all of the videos, but I very much am enjoying continuing to engage uh, with you, the audience, and um, look forward to seeing you next week. Take care, all the best. Bye-bye.